So today we're going to talk about chapter 5, the second half of chapter 5, pages 179 to 192. Uh, this is the second part of the DNA and chromosomes chapter. We'll start off today talking a little bit about the structure of chromosomes in general, just so we're all on the same page of how chromosomes are organized. Then we'll move on to chromosome organization and discuss a little bit about the genes on chromosomes and how they're arranged in a typical cell. We'll move from there to the different states that chromosomes take, especially with relation to the cell cycle. So as the cell goes through its life cycle, how does the structure and organization of chromosomes change? We'll switch gears entirely then and talk a little bit about how DNA is packaged in general. This involves the basic subunit of the nucleosome, and nucleosomes come together to form chromatin. And we'll wrap up the lecture talking about how the structure of chromatin is regulated, uh, specifically how nucleosomes are modified to change chromatin, and how chromatin and epigenetics come together to kind of make a her heritability that supersedes or stands on top of just basic DNA sequence. So just to kind of connect this to the last lecture, we spent our last lecture talking more about DNA as a general molecule, a physical molecule, almost a chemical molecule. We talked about the overall structure of DNA. We talked quite a bit about nucleotides, the subunit or the functional subunit of DNA. And we also tried to spend some time highlighting the different ways that DNA can store information. That's the genetic code and DNA used to build proteins, DNA sequences equatable to an amino acid sequence, and all of that information. However, the way that DNA is organized in a eukaryotic cell far exceeds this kind of simple idea of nucleotide sequences on two anti-parallel base-paired hydrogen bonded strands. So in other way, words, the way that DNA is organized is much more involved and much more complicated than just considering the sequence of nucleotides on complementary DNA strands. So genes are of course found on DNA and genes are arranged on DNA molecules in fairly specific ways. More importantly, the DNA in eukaryotic cells has to be condensed and compacted in order to fit in that cell's nucleus. DNA mo molecules are very, very long, and cell nuclei are very small, and so somehow we have to cram all that DNA into a cell's nucleus. What makes it challenging is that this compaction of DNA has to be organized. It must be regulated. It has to be monitored by the cell to be sure that it's occurring uh, accurately. And most importantly, it has to be reversible. In other words, the cell must have a way to get back to that DNA, to access that DNA when it needs it again. And so we have to condense this DNA down many, many orders of magnitude, but then we have to be able to access it on demand as well. So that's a very challenging thing for the cell to accomplish. Let's talk a little bit about how much DNA we actually have in our cells. And the textbook uses itself as a good example just for basic information content. If we imagine your textbook, the, the letters of your textbook, as the DNA genome, uh, the typical average sized human gene would take up one page of your textbook in sequence. In other words, uh, if we were to represent one human gene, a typical average sized gene, we would have nothing but A's, T's, G's, and C's on one whole page from your textbook. So that's about the size of a single human gene. If we wanted to represent the entire human genome, we would require about 1,000 textbooks, all the size of your cell and molecular textbook, filled with nothing but the A's, T's, G's, and C's of your genome. So there's a lot of information contained in your genome. There's a lot of DNA in your nucleus. And all of that DNA needs to be compacted, needs to be condensed, but needs to be monitored, organized, and cataloged so that we can access particular information, access particular sequences of DNA when we need them. All right, so that's the intro portion of the lecture here. Let's move on to talk a little bit about the structure of eukaryotic chromosomes in general. The average diameter of a human cell's nucleus is about 5 to 8 microns, or micrometers in diameter. To give that some kind of frame of reference, the average human hair has a width of about 65 microns. So you're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 nuclei side by side by side uh, being the width of a single human hair. So it, it's small. I mean, there's no surprise there. The nucleus of a human cell is small. The human genome is six feet long. 
And what we really mean by that is that there's six feet of DNA in every single one of your cells. So if you were to go into a single human cell and get out all of the DNA in that one cell and then stretch it out so that it's one long linear molecule of DNA and put all of those individual DNA molecules end to end, you would have six feet of DNA in length. That's a lot of DNA in a single human cell. And you got to cram all six feet of that DNA into something that's about the tenth of one human hair in diameter. So that's a lot of DNA to fit into a pretty small space. The text makes the comparison that this is like taking 24 miles of a very, very thin thread and stuffing all of that thread into the center of a container that's the size of about a hollow tennis ball. Again, that's a lot of DNA to put into a nucleus. When we discuss eukaryotic cells, we use the term chromosomes. And when we say chromosomes, what we really mean are long, contiguous, single molecules of DNA that are packaged or condensed so that they can fit readily inside a single cell's nucleus. And again, we take with that the connotation that it's not just stuffed in there, that there is some organization. And, even more importantly, that it's organized and packaged in such a way that individual replicated chromosomes can be easily dealt out to daughter cells when cells divide uh, during the process of mitosis. So we're going to spend about the second half of this lecture talking in detail about how DNA is physically packaged. Uh, we'll just kind of cover it very, very simply right here so you have a general sense of what we mean, but we will go over the details uh, towards the end of the lecture. When we say that DNA is packaged, uh, we can use the analogy of the way that rope is packaged or extension cords are condensed or twine is made to take up lesser room. In other words, quite physically, when DNA is packaged, it's looped, it's coiled, it's spooled. It is a long, linear molecule, and it is stored and compacted the way that we store other long things that we deal with. So we see here the rope is bundled, and the extension cord is coiled, and the twine is spooled. That is, in essence, how DNA is packaged. But again, it's done in an organized way so that the DNA doesn't become tangled and knotted on itself, which is important, but also so that individual sequences are still recognizable, unpackaged, and made ex accessible. So in other words, if I were to decide that I needed to access a gene that was right here on this extension cord, the DNA is packaged in such a way that I could readily find that sequence, remove it from the spool, or remove it from the coil, and access it and use it in the way that I need to. So it's a truly amazing process, uh, even more amazing when, when we go over how it works. It's also important to note here, and I will only note it here, that bacterial cells are not linear. Bacterial cells have circular chromosomes. The DNA that makes up a bacterial genome is circular whereas our own chromosomes are linear. And so for that reason, bacterial genomes are packaged in a completely different way as our own. It's packaged through a process called supercoiling. Um, if you'd like to see very simply how supercoiling works, what you can do is pause the lecture right now and go get yourself an intact rubber band. Um, I will wait patiently while you do that. When you come back, unpause the lecture. If you've gone ahead and done that and you have the rubber band now, what I'd like you to do is pinch the rubber band, leave it open, leave it relaxed so it's a true circle, and pinch just any area of that rubber band between your uh, pointer finger and your thumb of one hand so that you're keeping that portion stable. And then with the, forefinger, with the pointer finger and the thumb of your other hand, I'd like you to grab the rubber band on the other side and just twist, twirl it. And keep twisting and twirling it, keep twisting and twirling it while you keep your first fingers squeezed. And you will see eventually that rubber band is going to start to kind of twist in on itself. It's going to take up less room, it's going to coil, it's going to knot, it's, a, it's going to compact. And that is supercoiling. I mean, there's no analogy in there, there. That's exactly how bacterial cells package their DNA, is they just twirl and twist and twirl and twirl and twist until the circular genome kind of bunches up into this pseudo knot and takes up much less room. But we are unashamedly and proudly narcissistic in this class. We care about eukaryotic cells and only eukaryotic cells because that's what we are. So we won't talk about bacteria anymore today. We'll spend the rest of the time talking about eukaryotic DNA. <coughs> Excuse me. So in eukaryotic cells, the DNA of the genome is distributed among many different chromosomes. 
eukaryotic cells have numerous linear chromosomes and different species of eukaryotes have different numbers of chromosomes and so species have a pretty unique chromosome number and it is um, stable in that species. There's no correlation between the chromosome number or the genome size and the complexity of the organism. What I mean by that is more complex organisms don't have larger genomes or more chromosomes per se. Uh, and likewise, less developed organisms don't have smaller genomes or fewer numbers of chromosomes. We'll highlight that in a number of different ways, but first we'll look at these muntjacks, if that's how you pronounce them. These are kind of like a deer type, antelope type thing that lives in China and in India. These two muntjacks are extremely related. They are closely related species to one another. They are similar in their morphology and their appearance and their behavior. They are uh, very closely related species. However, look at the genomes of these two organisms. The Indian muntjac has three chromosomes two pairs of somatic chromosomes and then this weird sex chromosome where there's actually two Y's and a single X but this is the genome of the Indian muntjac. The genome of the Chinese muntjac is extremely different in its chromosome number. We see many many pairs of very very small chromosomes. In fact it looks as though there's about 22 plus the sex chromosomes. Now what makes it interesting is that the genome sizes of these two munchaks are actually quite similar. Uh, here we just have many, many small chromosomes, and here we have a few very large chromosomes. But you can see the chromosome number really has no effect on species at all, because we have very different chromosome numbers between these two munchaks, but very, very similar species. Driving that point home again, the organism on this planet with the largest number of chromosomes known to man is the fern, this plant called adder's tongue. Adder's tongue in the diploid state has 1,440 chromosomes. That's an incredible number of chromosomes. Again, it's the largest number known to man, and it's in a plant. The largest genome to have yet been discovered is in the amoeba, the single-celled eukaryotic amoeba, I won't even try to pronounce the scientific name. But this amoeba has the largest genome known to man, and that genome is 670 billion nucleotides long. It is just amazing. And that's about 200 times larger than the human genome. So to put these numbers in some perspective, we all should know that we have 46 chromosomes in the human species. We have about 3.2 billion nucleotides. So we have a big genome, but quite a bit smaller than this amoeba in genome size and many 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 fewer chromosomes than the fern and so I guess I rest my case in a sense that obviously complexity has no correlation to chromosome number or genome size I think it's safe to say that humans are the most complex physiological organism on the planet so Taken together, regardless of the species, any single chromosome, whether it's from adder's tongue, from the muntjac, from humans, from amoeba, if we're talking about a single chromosome, what we mean is a very long DNA molecule that is wrapped up and packaged by proteins. DNA and the proteins that are involved in packaging it are collectively referred to as chromatin. So when we say chromatin, we mean packaged DNA, and, and that packaging is being done by proteins. Please keep in mind that in addition to the packaging proteins, DNA is constantly being bombarded by many different proteins. These proteins are probing DNA for mutations, manipulating DNA for various DNA-related processes, proteins bind to DNA, and so there's a huge amount of proteins that physically interact with DNA on a constant basis. But only a few subset of those proteins are actually involved in packaging the DNA. These other proteins are involved in processes such as DNA repair, replication, the expression of genes, and all of that. With the exception of sex cells, gametes, reproductive cells, and extremely specialized cells, for example, red blood cells, every single cell in your body contains two nearly identical copies of every chromosome. So it is accurate to say that you have 23 pairs of chromosomes, giving you your 46 total chromosomes. Each of these two nearly identical copies make up what we call a homologous chromosome pair. And, of course, from genetics, you inherit one member of this pair from your father, 
while the other member of the pair was inherited from your mother. So we have one chromosome represented in our genomes, one from each parent for each pair of chromosomes. Each of all you out there, you have 23 pairs of nearly identical chromosomes, and that includes the 23rd pair of the sex chromosomes. You all have two X's that are nearly identical. I have 22 pairs of nearly identical chromosomes, plus a 23rd pair, which is not nearly identical at all. Being male, I have an XY pair on my 23rd, and those two are non-homologous chromosomes. But all of us are human beings, and whether we're male or female, we all have 46 chromosomes total. And what's represented here is what's called a karyotype. This is just an artificially organized photograph of human chromosomes. Uh, human chromosomes are isolated and stained using fluorescent dyes, as we see here. And then they're kind of plucked out and arranged in size order. And so these are the homologous pairs. Homologous pair number 1, number 2, number 3, number 4, all the way to 22. And then in males, the non-homologous sex chromosomes, XY. And in females, of course, these would be homologous chromosomes, XX. What's important to note, just to say it again, is for each of these homologous pairs, one of those chromosomes came from the father and one came from the mother. And so in this case, for example, this chromosome came from the father and this came from the mother. Maybe this from the mother and this from the father, from the mother, from the father, etc. So each of us have one full set of chromosomes from one parent and a homologous set for the other giving us our pair. All right, so before we move on, I just want to kind of drive home the point. And I don't want you all to start thinking of these concepts or these terms as different independent things. I think the real danger at this point is that you start thinking of DNA as, as one thing, and then genes are something separate from that, and chromosomes are some third thing that you now have to keep in mind. And that's not accurate at all. Please, please keep in mind that all of these things we're discussing are the same thing. They are all DNA. DNA, as we said in that first lecture, is nothing more than a long chain of nucleotides strung together in a particular sequence. That's what DNA is, chains of nucleotides. Some of these sequences, some subsets of these chains, contain information that allows the cell to build a protein. And so we call those subsets genes. But genes are nothing more than segments of DNA sequence in a larger DNA molecule. Long molecules of DNA are too long to kind of just hang there loose, and they're too big to fit into nuclei, and so they're wrapped up and condensed and packaged into structures that we call chromosomes. But still, chromosomes are nothing more than DNA, sequences of nucleotides, that are wrapped up and packaged so that they take up less room. And so this schematic, I think, I hope, shows that best. DNA is DNA is DNA. That's all DNA is. It's chains of nucleotides, G's, A's, C's, and T's strung together. So this is a DNA molecule, double-stranded helical DNA molecule. Some subset of this molecule contains the information for building a protein. So we call that subset a gene. But as shown here, it's just more of that same molecule. See? It's just DNA, 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 and some of that DNA contains information that we can use to build a protein. So we call that a gene, but it's just DNA. This DNA, when all strung out, is way too long, so we package it. We just wrap it up. We coil it. We loop it. We spool it. And when we do that and we package it and we make it take up less room, we call that structure a chromosome. But the chromosome is nothing more than DNA that's been wrapped up. So it's almost like the old cartoon thing where, you know, you find the end of the string of a long, of a big sweater that, you know, Bugs Bunny is wearing. And you pull on that string and you unravel the whole sweater so eventually there's no sweater on him at all. That's the chromosome. The chromosome is the sweater. And it's made up of that string of DNA. So theoretically, we could find one loose end of DNA and pull 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 and just unravel that chromosome until there was nothing left. Nothing left. Because the chromosome is really nothing more than DNA sequences wrapped up. Of course, there's proteins there involved in the wrapping. But the nuts and bolts of it, what's important is the DNA. So please, keep in mind that it's all DNA. A DNA molecule is just a stretch of nucleotides strung together. 
and some of those sequences make up genes, and if we package that DNA up, we call it a chromosome, but it's really all DNA in the end. We're just looking at that DNA and discussing it differently, that's all. Okay, so with all of that in mind, let's just kind of keep in mind that chromosomes are nothing more than strings of genes, sequences of DNA, and that's what this schematic shows here. This happens to be a schematic from yeast, but it could represent any organism. And we have a very small segment of a genome of a chromosome here, and we're looking at, I don't know what this would wind up being, about 60,000 nucleotides, more or less. We see our two strands of DNA, they're anti-parallel, so the top is going 5 prime to 3 prime left to right, the bottom is going 5 prime to 3 prime right to left, we know what that means now. And we see that there are genes located on these DNA strands. Some of these genes are on the bottom strand and some of them are on the top, but there are genes, protein coding information, as part of this DNA sequence. A gene is considered the functional unit of heredity, whatever that is supposed to mean. That's the genetic definition of a gene. Really, more molecularly speaking, we define any DNA sequence that can be transcribed, which means copied, into an RNA molecule. That's what we call a gene. If there's a sequence of DNA on a chromosome, and that sequence is copied into RNA, that is a gene, by molecular definition. Now, the vast majority of DNA sequences that are transcribed are transcribed for the purpose of building proteins, so most genes are protein coding genes, but there are exceptions to that rule which we'll get to later on in the semester. Some species, and yeast is an example, have very dense chromosomes. When we say dense chromosomes, we mean that most of the DNA of the chromosomes is dedicated for protein coding genes, that most of the DNA space is dedicated for coding proteins. And that's what you see up here. There's very little real estate available in this genome from yeast. You see most of it on one strand or the other is dedicated to genes. Other species, and we're a good example, have what I would call inefficient genomes where there are large amounts of intergenic DNA, that is DNA that lies between independent genes, and that's summarized in this table here. This is DNA that doesn't seem to do anything. So what this table shows, in essence, is how many genes are found in average one million bases of DNA. Said differently, if you were to go into these species and isolate a random one million bases of DNA, how many genes would you expect to find in that million bases? You see, in yeast, it's about 500 genes per million bases of DNA. And that's fairly dense. C. elegans is the, a microscopic flatworm. About 200 genes per million bases of DNA for elegans. Drosophila melanogaster is a fruit fly, about 117 genes. Arabidopsis thaliana is a weed, it's a plant. 220 genes per million bases, and here we are, human beings, uh, depending on how that DNA is sequenced, but on average 12 to 15 genes per million bases. Now it is somewhat true that human genes are a little bit larger than genes from these lesser organisms, but not so much to explain the discrepancy. And the fact of the matter is we just have fewer genes per unit DNA in the human genome. And that's why we require 3.2 billion bases of DNA. So this intergenic DNA that doesn't contain genes, that doesn't code for proteins, seems to serve no known purpose. It is referred to as junk DNA. However, it's my personal belief that this is a bit of a pompous name. This junk DNA with no yet known purpose is conserved. The cells go to great lengths to repair this DNA when it's mutated. Uh, individuals have similar sequences in these regions, which means that the, the cells are trying to keep this DNA uh, accurate. And so just because we don't understand it yet doesn't necessarily mean it's junk. It just doesn't code for proteins. So uh, we do have a lot of this extra DNA in our genome. It's just not quite clear yet why that DNA is there. <clears throat> so. Moving on, I just want to make it clear that we will not cover mitosis this semester, even though we will refer to it from time to time. I am working on the assumption that you've all been exposed to mitosis in genetics, and I don't have to cover it again. I'm sure none of you want to go over it again either. I'm also assuming that you all have been exposed to at least the basics of the cell cycle, that you know somewhat what G0, G1, G2, what S phase and M phase are. 
We will go over the cell cycle in great detail much later on in this semester, uh, but I am working on the assumption that you have a general idea of what the cell cycle is. If you're not comfortable with mitosis or the cell cycle and you find that because of that lack of comfort you're struggling with some of this material, please, please, I encourage you to come see me right away. We'll get all that straightened out. We'll get you back on top of things. You don't need to have mastered those topics to get through the material I'm about to go into, but I'm going to be referring to some of these terms. So if you do find yourself getting lost, please just come see me and we'll, we'll get that fixed. So what we're going to talk about now is how chromosomes change their states, the different states that chromosomes exist in, as a cell goes through the cell cycle. I think we said it best in our last lecture. For DNA to do what DNA does, it has to have two main properties. It has to be replicatable. The information has to be contained in the DNA itself to allow it to be faithfully copied. And it also must hold information. There has to be a mechanism by which DNA can store encoded information that can then be used to build proteins. Additionally, after being replicated, cells must have a mechanism where new chromosome copies can be faithfully and accurately dealt out to new daughter cells. In other words, it's not enough for a new human daughter cell to simply get 46 any chromosomes. It must be that each new daughter cell gets one and only one copy of each individual chromosome. In other words, it truly is like dealing out cards from a deck. One new daughter cell must get one of the copies of your mother's chromosome number one, and the other new daughter cell must get the other copy of your mother's chromosome number one. The first daughter cell has to get the copy of your father's chromosome number one, and the other daughter cell has to get the other copy of your father's chromosome number one. And then your first cell has to get mom's number two, and the other cell has to get mom's number two. On and on and on and on. So it is this process of one chromosome for you and one for you. The next chromosome for you and one for you. Dealing out these identical copied chromosomes to each of the new daughter cells. So literally, during cell division, copied replicated chromosomes must be dealt out so that each new daughter cell gets the exact same genome that the maternal cell started with. And this is the beauty and elegance of mitosis. The whole point of mitosis as a cellular process is to ensure that just this happens. Now before mitosis we have the I phase of the cell cycle, that's interphase. This is the portion of the cell cycle when the DNA is replicated. And of course, mitosis is also called the M phase in the cell cycle. This is when mitosis occurs, chromosomes get dealt out, and cells divide. This is shown very, very simply in this schematic here from your textbook. We see that when we begin interphase, we have one and only one copy of each chromosome. Uh, that's not to say that we only have one of each homologous pair. This could be chromosome number one from dad, and this is chromosome number one from mom, but we have only one copy of each chromosome, so 46 chromosomes total. Then during interphase, we have replication, so now we have two identical copies of each chromosome. In other words, we have 92 total chromosomes in the cell. Mitosis is the involved five-stage process that deals out each of these identical, pro identical chromosomes to two new daughter cells, so that what we wind up with are two new cells with the identical complement or genome of the initial maternal cell before replication. And that's what we need. We have to deal out dad's chromosome number one to you, dad's chromosome number one to you, mom's chromosome number one to you, mom's chromosome number one to you, etc. Now during interphase, chromosomes are more relaxed and less packaged. This allows them to be replicated more easily. They're not all bunched up and tightly compacted. However, during the dealing phase of mitosis, when these chromosomes actually have to be moved around and transported, it makes more sense for them to be smaller, more dense, more compact. And so chromosomes during mitosis are at their densest and most packaged states. What's maybe even more amazing is that even when chromosomes are at their most relaxed during interphase, when they're at their least packaged, when they are probably most prone to becoming tangled because they are not tightly wrapped, they are still very highly organized. 
In fact, in the nucleus, each interphase chromosome has its own little zone or its own particular region that it remains in. That's shown here. Uh, here on the left is a schematic of an interphase cell. We see the cell membrane. We see the nucleus here. And inside the nucleus, we see these spots. If we kind of zoom in on the nucleus only, and that's what we're looking at here on the right, these colors correspond to individual chromosomes. And what we see is that the chromosomes are not overlapping. We can see that because the colors are distinct. There are regions of green, regions of yellow, regions of light blue, regions of dark blue. What that means is that each individual chromosome is staying in its own localized area. It's staying in its own zone. So these chromosomes don't intermingle, even though they're very uncompacted. Uh, they're not very dense, and they're, they're most prone to being tangled. It's believed that the reason for this is because it prevents the chromosomes from becoming tangled. Each chromosome, each chromosome is kind of segregated into its own region, but it's just amazing. Also, specific regions of specific chromosomes attach to the inner surface of the nuclear membrane. What we mean by that is the nucleus itself is, of course, a membrane-bound organelle. The DNA is inside the nucleus, no surprise there. And so the nuclear membrane, the membrane surrounding the nucleus, has two sides. It has the outer side, which faces the rest of the cell, and the inner side, which faces the interior of the nucleus. During specific portions of the cell cycle, some chromosomes hook on to the inner surface of the nuclear envelope. They become attached to the nuclear membrane itself on the inside face of that membrane. It's just incredible. They become stuck there. It's found that this adherence to the nuclear membrane plays a role in regulating DNA-specific processes, such as expressing genes or repairing DNA. But why regulating these processes requires adhering to the nuclear membrane, how these mechanisms work, is still very, very much unknown and, and being explored. It's just strange. It's strange that the DNA would become stuck to the inner surface of the nuclear membrane and that that would be important and done on purpose in order to achieve some DNA-specific processes. The best and most classic example of organization in the nucleus is the structure called the nucleolus. The nucleolus is the site for specific types of genes, specifically all of the genes that are involved in making RNAs for the ribosome. Now, you may know from genetics that the ribosome is the machinery of the cell which involves, which allows the cell to make protein. So the ribosome is the protein-making machine of the cell. The ribosome requires RNAs to work properly. And the genes for making those RNAs are all clustered in the nucleolus. And so the nucleolus is a single site containing exclusively the genes needed to make RNAs for these ribosomes, for these protein-making machines. Why the nucleolus exists, why these genes have to be segregated from the rest of the chromosomes is still not known. The nucle nucleolus was described, I think, in the late 1800s, and we still don't really understand why it needs to exist. Uh, we simply understand how it exists, but not the why. All right, so we're going to switch gears in just a moment into the DNA packaging itself and talk a little bit about how DNA is packaged. But before we do that, I'd like to take a final moment to just appreciate how dramatically this DNA packaging is achieved. Uh, the smallest somatic chromosome in our genome, the smallest non-sex chromosome that we have as human beings, is chromosome number 22. Chromosome number 22 consists of 48 million base pairs. That's 48 million nucleotide pairs. And if it were all stretched out and uncompacted to its fullest extent, it would measure about 1.5 centimeters long, which is pretty long for a molecule of DNA. And again, this is the smallest we have. During mitosis, chromosome 22 measures about 2 microns in length. And please keep in mind that during mitosis is when DNA is at its most compact. So when chromosome number 2 is compacted at its greatest extent, it measures about 2 micrometers in length. That is a 10,000-fold compaction. So chromosome 22, when you compare its most stretched out state to its most compacted state, is compacted 10,000 times. To equate that to some real-world measurements, if you can imagine this, it's like taking a yardstick, a meter stick, and compacting the length of that stick down so that it took up four one-thousandths of a single inch. That is just 
incredible. Even at its loosest, even during interphase, when chromosome 22 is in its least compacted state, it is still 500 times more compact than it would be at its fully extended 1.5 centimeter state. So never, under natural uh, conditions in a human cell, never is DNA completely stretched out. It is always compacted to some extent or another. So the question becomes, how do we achieve these just mind-bogglingly ridiculous levels of compaction while still providing the cell with a mechanism to access any sequence of DNA it needs to on demand. Remember, that's key. We can't just lock up all of this DNA and pack it away into the nucleus. We need to access different regions of the DNA at different times. And we can't even always, as the cell, predict which sequences we need because cells are existing in an environmental state. In other words, we might have genes for dealing with heat stress that we don't need right now, so we want to pack them away. Well, what if we go into a hot environment? What if the cells begin to heat up to a, a unsustainable temperature? Well, we need to access those genes right away. We didn't foresee we needed to access them. We didn't know we were going to need to access them. We packed them away for long term, but now we need to find those genes and access them very quickly or the cell is going to die. So we have to get to these 10,000-fold compaction levels, which just boggle the mind, and do it in such an organized way that we can access any sequence of DNA we need on demand in real time to express those genes or repair that sequence or do whatever we need to do with that DNA. Just amazing. The way that that's done in principle, the way that DNA is reversibly compacted, is through nucleosomes. Nucleosomes are the basic units of eukaryotic chromosomes. And personally, on a personal level, I just love nucleosomes. I'm, in one way or another, almost all of my professional research life has been dedicated to studying nucleosomes, how they work, and more specifically, how genes are expressed when they are found in nucleosomes. So this stuff is very near and dear to my heart. And if you're interested in doing research and you find this material interesting, uh, by all means, approach me, and I'd be happy to tell you about what we do in my research program. So nucleosomes are the most fundamental unit of packaged eukaryotic DNA, but nucleosomes are made of something. So what are nucleosomes made of? The fundamental component of an individual nucleosome are the histone proteins. There are four different histone proteins that are part of the nucleosome itself. There's also a fifth, which we'll talk about in just a minute or two. These four histone proteins are called histone 2A, histone 2b, histone 3, and histone 4. And for short, we refer to them as H2a, H2b, H3, and H4. Two identical copies of each of these four histone proteins come together to form something we call an octamer. An octamer simply refers to a large protein complex that's made up of eight, that's the oct part, made up of eight individual protein subunits. And those eight protein subunits are the two copies of H2A, the two of H2B, the two of H3, and the two of H4. So these eight histone proteins come together, and what they form is a protein spool. So hopefully some of you kind of see where this is heading. The DNA, which is what we're trying to work with here in the first place, we're trying to compact DNA down, the DNA wraps around the outer edge of this histone spool, just like thread wrapping around a metal spool. There's really very little analogy here. This is how it works. Here we have spools made out of metal, and in our cells the spools are made out of histone proteins. Fine. And around the edge of those spools are wrapped thread. And the thread here is analogous to the DNA, wrapped around the spool. This wrapping of this thread around this spool is a way to compact that thread, keep it organized, keep it arranged, keep it from clumping up and getting tangled. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with our DNA. So here, this is a figure from your textbook, but this shows it very nicely, I think, schematically. Again, we have two identical copies of each of the four histone proteins. That gives us eight total proteins, and they come together to form a cylinder or a spool of protein. That is the octamer of histones. DNA then wraps around the outer edge of that spool, compacting it, as we see here, and this is the nucleosome. Specifically, about 147 base pairs of DNA wrap around the histone spool, and this is our first level of compaction. And this compaction achieves about a one-third compaction. In other words, once we wrap DNA around histones, we shrink it to about one-third its original extended length. So we've decreased the overall length of DNA by spooling it. We've decreased it by about a third. 
and this is our first level of DNA compaction. Again, to put a fine point on it, a nucleosome is defined as a histone octamer, two copies each of the histone proteins, and the DNA wrapped around it. That is a single nucleosome, the histones and the DNA. Now the DNA wraps around the histones a couple times and then it exits off of that nucleosome. And when that DNA exits the nucleosome, it leads to the next. Linker DNA is the DNA sequence that holds one nucleosome to the other. And the linker DNA is devoid of proteins. I'll go to the figure here to make it a little bit clearer. So here what we're looking at are three individual nucleosomes held together by linker DNA. But it's all DNA. It's all one continuous sequence of DNA. So here, if you can track the, the mouse arrow, the DNA comes in over here. It loops around this histone core a couple times, and then it comes off of that onto the next one. Loop, 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 loop. And then the same DNA molecule, no breaks, goes to the next nucleosome and loops, 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 and then off to the fourth and off to the fifth, etc., etc. The DNA that's found between the individual nucleosomes is called the linker DNA, and it's devoid of proteins just because it's leading us to the next nucleosome. The linker DNA can range from very, very short in length, about five base pairs, to quite long, about 200 base pairs, but the average length is 50 base pairs of DNA, linking one nucleosome to the next. This pattern of linked nucleosomes, this is the basic fundamental unit of DNA compaction. This is our first level of DNA compaction. And it's referred to as beads on a string, with each nucleosome a single bead and the string being made up of the DNA itself. In fact, we can look at electron micrographs of these structures, and this is a true photograph of DNA wrapped on nucleosomes uh, taken by an electron microscope, and you see the beads on the spring, string here as well. You can indeed make out the individual DNA molecule. You see it here, here. You can see the string holding these nucleosomes together. And of course, the darker, larger masses are nucleosomes themselves. So this is a single DNA molecule, no breaks in the chain of nucleotides. And we come in here, and we loop around one nucleosome, and link to the next, and loop around that, and link to the next, and loop around that, and link to the next, and so on, and so on, and so on. We'll get a couple other views of nucleosomes. Here's the schematic that we've been using. We can look at the nucleosome head on. So we're actually looking at the protein spool itself. And you can see the individual histone proteins are color coded here. And then the DNA is gray, wrapped around the outer edge of the nucleosome. So again, the DNA comes in, wraps around a couple times, and then exits out to the next nucleosome. If we look at that nucleosome along the sides, we're actually looking at the edge of the spool. We can see the histone proteins in the center there peeking through the DNA, making up the spool. But now we see the DNA is wrapped around. The DNA comes in through the top, wraps around once, wraps around almost two full times, and then out again to the next nucleosome. This is uh, my preferred image of a nucleosome. I have this as my wallpaper on every electronic device I own. Oh, it's a very beautiful structure. Again, we're looking at the head-on view, the histone proteins in the center, and the DNA wrapped around the edge. What's important to note, among other things, is that DNA binds to histones nonspecifically. What we mean by that is any DNA sequence can be wrapped around histones. The reason for this is a very simple electrostatic interaction. DNA is negative. We said that in the last lecture. We have the phosphate sugar backbone made up of negative phosphates. DNA as a molecule has an overall negative charge. Histone proteins are largely positive. They include positively charged amino acids. And so it's a very simple opposites attract interaction there. Negative DNA likes to be wrapped around positive histones. And so any DNA, regardless of its sequence, will wrap around histones favorably. Also, I'll come back to this in a little bit, but I do want you to notice that we have these protein ends kind of projecting out of the histone cores themselves. So each of the four histone proteins has its own protein end that kind of pops out or projects out from the histone proper. These are called tails. These are called histone tails. And I'm not going to go into them now, but I'm planting the seed because we're going to come back to those later on in the lecture. But they're just parts of the histone proteins that the end of that amino acid chain that kind of sticks out of the nucleosome itself. All right, so we've got our first level of compaction described then. Nucleosomes themselves compact DNA about one-third. 
And all eukaryotic DNA is packaged in this way. Histone proteins are very highly conserved among all species. In fact, the textbook makes a point that out of 102 amino acids in the histone proteins, um, even if you compare histones from pea plants and from cows, only two of those 102 amino acids are different. So this has been the way to package DNA for a very, very long time, evolutionarily speaking. This is a very highly conserved process. So we've got our first compaction down. Nucleosomes compact DNA to about one-third their full extended length, but uh, this still is not compacted enough. Obviously, we've got to get DNA much more tightly compacted than that if it's going to fit in the nucleus. And in addition to that, DNA rarely exists in this kind of simple, extended, beads-on-a-string configuration. Uh, there's usually more compaction going on, even in an interphase chromosome. The least packaged physiological form of DNA. So what we mean by that is the least packaged form of DNA that you would find in a living cell is referred to as the 30 nanometer fiber. Now to imagine or analogize the 30 nanometer fiber, imagine that nucleosomal DNA is a pearl necklace and each pearl on that necklace is an individual nucleosome. Okay? Now what I'd like you to imagine is taking that pearl necklace and just wrap it around your finger. So coil that necklace around your finger so that you've almost made a helix of the necklace, or coil of the necklace around your finger. That is the 30 nanometer fiber of chromatin. That is the least packaged form of DNA that you would find in a living cell. I think this schematic shows it best. Unfortunately, this isn't from your text, uh, but I do think it shows it. Obviously, we're looking at individual nucleosomes here. The DNA is in light blue, and the histone core is in green. And I hope you can see what they're trying to show here, which is that we come in with this beads on a string, but then we coil it, looped, looped, looped. You can imagine your finger right down the center there, and that pearl necklace being wrapped around your finger. This is the 30 nanometer fiber. It is a coiled helix of nucleosomal DNA, of DNA already wrapped in nucleosomes, and of course this further compacts the DNA. Forming the 30 nanometer fiber requires the fifth histone protein we alluded to before called H1. And you can see here, uh, this shows both views, we see the coiled coil of uh, the 30 nanometer fiber over here. Uh, this we're looking down into the barrel of the coil, so it's as though we've removed our finger and we're looking down the hollow that our finger has left behind, and you can see the H1 histone here is involved in kind of maintaining this structure. The H1 histone is called the linker histone and is not found in the histone core proper. Instead, H1 is positioned on the edge of the nucleosome, and it's actually positioned specifically where the DNA is coming out of one nucleosome on its way to the next. And so here, we're kind of looking at a nucleosome side view. The DNA has come in. We don't see that. It's wrapped around a few times, and it's on its way to leave. And at this junction, as the DNA is leaving this nucleosome, that's where H1 is positioned. H1 here is shown in green. What H1 does is it changes the path of the DNA. So instead of going straight out the top, you can see that H1 kind of forces the DNA to go off to the side. This change in path promotes more of a twisting formation, and this twisting promotes the coiling of the 30 nanometer fiber. It actually allows the nucleosomal DNA to be wrapped a little bit more easily. I have an animation that's come with the textbook posted on Canvas. I've technically assigned it that you have to watch it, but obviously I'm not going to monitor that. But I do think it will assist you in kind of visualizing how the 30 nanometer, 30 nanometer fiber is created. And so please watch that animation on Canvas. And in fact, if you'd like, just pause the lecture right now and log into Canvas and go ahead and watch that animation. <coughs> Excuse me. Now once you've made the 30 nanometer fiber, that fiber, that rope of nucleosomal DNA is itself further looped and coiled to eventually form the 10,000 fold compacted mitotic chromosome. But this stage of compaction is pretty much still a black box. What I mean by that is we don't really know what's going on. Uh, no one really knows what's going on. We understand straight chains of DNA the nucleotide sequence of DNA very, very well. 
We understand nucleosomes extremely well. We know how nucleosomes form, we know how they wrap, we know how the DNA behaves on the nucleosomes. The 30 nanometer fiber has been extensively characterized. We also know how it is formed, what maintains DNA in that structure. Past that, we really have very little understanding about DNA compaction. I think this figure best illustrates that, actually, almost comically. We have naked DNA, pure DNA, with no proteins on it, and we can wrap that DNA around histone cores, creating nucleosomes. We've discussed that. We can then take this nucleosomal DNA and coil it around a central thing, a finger is the analogy, but coil it around something, and make this coiled helix of nucleosomal DNA. No problem. That's the 30 nanometer fiber. Then things get a little vague. See here, we just see that 30 nanometer fiber is being looped. What's holding those loops together? No idea. What's catalyzing those loops to form? No idea. What maintains those loops? We have no idea. Then that kind of looped structure is <laughs> bundled up here in this very amorphous blob into some larger structure called condensed section of chromosome. We have no idea what that is at all. And then eventually that becomes a mitotic chromosome. The way that this DNA forms this structure, we don't understand. The proteins needed to promote and then maintain mitotic chromosomes, we have no idea what those are either. This whole process is a mystery. This is one of the most amazing pictures that I'll probably show this semester. This is a true high-resolution electron micrograph of a human, two human chromosomes, actually the X and the Y, the two sex chromosomes, shown on a slide, on a cover slip slide. So the slide is actually shown here. Um, deformations in the glass of the slide are these what look like boulders here. The only thing that's false about this image is the color. The colors have been falsely added, but this is a human X chromosome and a human Y chromosome. Now because it's a high resolution image, we can zoom in a little bit and still keep some detail. So what I'm zooming in on here in this image is just the foot of this chromosome here. Okay, so I've just enlarged that. And you can kind of see these wisps coming off here. I don't know, I hope you can. Uh, you can see those kind of little wisps. They look like stray threads coming off of this. These are 30 nanometer fibers. That's what these are. So these are coiled helices of nucleosomal DNA. Now it looks as though these 30 nanometer fibers are just knotted and tangled and just a mess to make up this human chromosome, but it's not the case. This is a highly organized, highly regulated, carefully packaged DNA chromosome. In other words, the location of every single sequence of DNA is known by the cell. If the cell needs to access a specific X chromosome gene, it knows exactly where to go on this highly compacted molecule to access that gene. But how it knows that, how it has arranged this chromosome, how this compaction has been achieved, we have no idea. Now, that's just nuts to begin with. But let's go one step further and talk about how totally ridiculous it is that not only have we created that compacted structure, but we need to monitor, regulate, and access it. Remember, the cell needs the ability for on-demand access to any DNA sequence at any time. There's not a single spot of DNA that is never needed. And much of DNA is needed on demand to deal with environmental insults, environmental changes, etc. So we need to have a mechanism by which we can unravel and in a localized way access DNA in order to do what we need to do to have the cell survive. I said it very early in the lecture, but I want to come back to it just so we don't lose our track. When we say chromatin, when we use the term chromatin, we are referring to any packaged DNA. Now when we say any packaged DNA, we mean DNA that is simply in nucleosomes all the way up to mitotic chromosomes. If DNA is being packaged, condensed, compacted with protein, it is chromatin. And when we say regulating chromatin, we really mean regulating the compaction or the packaging of DNA. So by regulating chromatin, we regulate access to DNA. We can tighten chromatin up and keep DNA away from other cellular processes. We can loosen, expose chromatin, and allow DNA to be accessible.
achieving these kind of localized unwrapping of needed sequences while maintaining the tightly packaged wrapped denseness of other sequences is the essence of chromatin regulation. And cells use a variety of different strategies to achieve this. Cells have a set of, kit, no, of tools, a set of tricks up their sleeve that allow them to get access to DNA sequences that are sequestered in chromatin. And of course, each different strategy requires its own cellular process, and so each strategy requires its own set of proteins. The first example we'll use is a common example. Uh, chromatin remodeling complexes are protein complexes that use the energy from ATP to simply push nucleosomes out of the way. So chromatin remodeling complexes hydrolyze ATP to release energy and then harness that energy to, in a brute force manner, push nucleosomes out of their way. <clears throat> so chromatin remodeling complexes physically force DNA to unwrap off of a nucleosome and then what they do is they simultaneously thread adjacent DNA back onto that nucleosome. So this is from your textbook and it shows it pretty well I think. See they have these color-coded markers so you can kind of track things. So keep your eye on this blue band here and the lighter blue bands here. In green we see the actual chromatin remodeling complex and the energy is coming from ATP. What this complex is doing is it is physically, energetically pulling this sequence of DNA here off of the nucleosome and then it is twisting the nucleosome core, the histone core, so that the sequences of DNA that feed behind the complex actually become wrapped. So you see how this blue band has gone from here all the way to the tip of the complex itself? That's because all of this DNA here has been wrapped onto this nucleosome where it was previously exposed. And then conversely, this DNA that we see here wrapped in the nucleosome has been released or has been unwrapped. So the nucleosome's just kind of been twisted or torqued to expose DNA sequences that were previously wrapped and wrapped DNA sequences that were previously exposed. By doing this, chromatin remodeling complexes free up short regions of DNA and get them out of nucleosomes. When that DNA is out of a nucleosome, it's now naked, it's bare, it's linker DNA. And so that DNA is accessible for other DNA-related processes. That could be gene expression, that could be repair, that could be any number of things that DNA is needed for. Chromatin remodeling complexes also rearrange what we call nucleosome arrays. An array of nucleosomes is simply a cluster of nucleosomes all behaving in a similar way together. So chromatin remodeling complexes can space nucleosomes out more on an array, exposing the underlying DNA. Or they can bunch up nucleosomes in an array and sequester that DNA again. That's shown in this diagram. Here we have condensed chromatin, where the nucleosomes are all very close together. The linker regions are very, very small. There's very little naked DNA there. And the chromatin remodeling complex comes in. It uses the energy of ATP, and it kind of spaces these nucleosomes out quite a bit more. You see there's a lot more linker DNA exposed. These are all exposed sequences now that could be the targets for other proteins and other processes. Uh, they call this decondensed chromatin. Chromatin that's a little bit more permissible, a little bit more accessible. During mitosis, most chromatin remodeling complexes are inactivated, and it's believed that this is done because most chromatin remodeling complexes loosen DNA. During mitosis, we want chromosomes in their most compact, most packaged form, and so we would not want chromatin remodeling complexes to be scooting around and being active under those conditions. The SWE sniff or switch sniff complex from yeast is the prime example of this type of complex, and shameless plug, but my research does heavily involve the switch sniff complex. I'm very interested in how chromatin remodeling complexes loosen up DNA for gene expression. Another strategy that cells use for DNA access when that DNA is in the context of chromatin involves those histone tails. Remember I pointed those histone tails out before and told you I was planting a seed for later and now that time has come. These histone tails are just the ends of the histone proteins that project out of the nucleosome proper, project out of the histone core, and they just kind of float there. These histone tails are very rich in the amino acid lysine. And the amino acid lysine is a positive amino acid. Lysine carries a positive charge on its side chain. Now remember, DNA is negative. So lysine amino acids in these histone tails, so there are lysines in these tails, those lysines interact favorably with the negative DNA. 
That favorable interaction between DNA and lysines serves to lock nucleosomes in place, make them very, very stable, and very, very hard to move. However, lysines can be acetylated, and that's just a chemical term for meaning that an acetyl group is added to the end of the lysine. When lysines are acetylated or acetylated, that positive charge is neutralized, and that's shown here. This is normal lysine. Here's the amino acid itself, and here's the side chain, and at the very end of that side chain, there's a positively charged amino group. This positive charge interacts favorably with negative DNA. However, we can acetylate that lysine, and by acetylating it, by adding this acetyl group, we remove that positive charge. Well, guess what leaves with that positive charge? we lose the favorable interaction that lysine had for DNA. So acetylation of lysines loosens the association between DNA and nucleosomes, weakens the nucleosome stability, and makes it easier to move. However, again, acetylated lysines can be deacetylated. The deacetylation of lysines removes the acetyl group. That restores the positive charge and once again locks the nucleosome in place. And so we have different complexes for these activities. Histone acetyl transferases, or HATs, are responsible for acetylation. HATs acetylate lysines, causing interactions to be loosened, causing DNA to be less stable on the nucleosome, promoting the accessibility of DNA. Histone deacetylation complexes, or HATs, I'm sorry, or HDACs, deacetylate histones. By deacetylating those histones, HDACs restore the positive charge, tighten the interaction between nucleosomes and histones, I'm sorry, between DNA and histones, lock nucleosomes in place, and thereby inhibit access to DNA. So what we have is a very beautiful reversible system here where HDACs and HATs oppose one another. You can use the analogy of a light switch. If you need access to DNA, you get your HATs in there. Acetylate all of those lysines, weaken all of those nucleosomes, get them movable get access to that DNA. And once you're done with your process, you want that DNA locked up again, call in your HDACs. Your HDACs will remove all of those acetyl groups, restore all those positive charges, restore the stability of the nucleosome, cause the lysines to interact more favorably with the DNA, lock those nucleosomes in place. But that's not permanent. If later on you need access again, your hats can come in and loosen all those nucleosomes, and then your HDACs can come in and tighten them up again. So truly a reversible system going between the two states as much as necessary. The saga complex is the most common and active hat in yeast, and also my work involves the saga complex. In fact, we are exploring in my work, and other labs, uh, of course, have done this before, how saga and the switch sniff complex work together. It appears as though in yeast, and it makes some intuitive sense, Saga comes in first and loosens nucleosomes through acetylation, and then, and only then, when that nucleosome is loose, can Sui Sniff come in and move it out of the way. Uh, even though you have the energy of ATP, it seems as though a deacetylated locked nucleosome is too hard to move by some chromatin remodeling complexes, and so those nucleosomes need to be loosened first through acetylation. Those are wonderfully interesting systems. Now those lysines that are present on the histone tails and other amino acids in the histone tails as well are also targets for other modifications in addition to acetylation. Lysines and other related amino acids in histone tails can be methylated. Methyl groups can be added to them. They can be phosphorylated. So phosphoryl groups can be added to them and other modifications as well. Sometimes, rarely, but sometimes these modifications affect the stability of the 30 nanometer fiber in general and also affect higher orders of compaction, just loosening DNA, but that's typically not what happens. More importantly, these modifications serve as what is called a histone code. Different patterns of modifications. Now again, the patterns of the modifications result in the recruitment and or activation of other proteins at the DNA, leading to different cellular phenomena. So it is the pattern of the modifications that have meaning. This is an incredible idea, fairly new in the field, but it seems to be true. It is the pattern of the modification that contains meaning for the cell, synonymous to how the DNA sequence encodes information. Here's an example. We're looking at the amino terminal tail, I'm sorry, the, the histone tail of histone H3. 
Now if we have a single modification, in this case it is the acetylation of lysine number 14, the 14th lysine in the chain, that seems to carry the information to promote transcription. So this is a signal to the cell that the gene wrapped by this nucleosome should be transcribed. It's almost like a sign that says if you see this, if you see this acetylation at this lysine, turn this gene on. If you see acetylation at lysine 9, that's a different signal with a different meaning for the cell. And it is believed, although not yet proven, that this signal is telling the cell to deposit some histones in this region. We have phosphorylation signals. In this case, we see phosphorylation at amino acid number 10 and amino acid number 28. When those two amino acids are phosphorylated, that seems to send a signal that the cell should get ready for mitosis or meiosis. It is a meaning of the signal. That same phosphorylation at 10 coupled with the acetylation at 14, right? So we've seen those two modifications before, but when you pair them up, that seems to be a signal for a transcription. We also have methylation signals that promote transcription. Other acetylation signals that pr promote histone deposition. Again, the main point here is not the details and what the signals mean. I will never hold you accountable for that. But the concept that we have a histone code, that the pattern of these modifications, phosphorylation here and acetylation here, means this to the cell. Methylation here, methylation here, methylation here means this to the cell. That is the histone code. The patterns of these modifications contain meaning to the cell. And the cell knows what to do with the DNA wrapped in these nucleosomes based on the histone code. Amazing. So hopefully it should be no surprise to you that the histone modifying enzymes responsible for these patterns are highly regulated. This is a very fine balance of processes here. All of these signals mean something. And so all the processes that they are signaling must be regulated and balanced. Now let's just wrap up with two concepts, the different states that chromosomes take during interphase, and then we'll wrap up with the idea of uh, epigenetics. DNA that's needed is made more accessible on demand. We need to have access to DNA that we need, and so that DNA needs to be less tightly compacted. Conversely, DNA that we don't need should be compacted and kept in a dense state because we don't need to access it in real time. This means that the overall state of a typical chromosome during interphase is pretty much heterogeneous in the sense that those regions of DNA that are needed are less densely compacted and those regions of the chromosome that are not needed are tightly compacted. Accessible DNA in an interphase chromosome, so the DNA that is not so tightly compacted, is referred to as euchromatin. It's an older historical name, but it's still used. Very compact DNA that is very inaccessible is called heterochromatin. Heterochromatin makes up about 10% of every or any interphase chromosome. And most of the heterochromatin is localized to the regions of the chromosome called the centromere, which you should know from genetics. The centromere is very important for mitosis. And the telomeres, which you may or may not know from genetics. Telomeres are the caps of the chromosomes. We'll be talking about them quite a bit in our next lecture. So about 10% of an interphase, chromatin is, of interphase chromosome is heterochromatin, and most of that heterochromatin is at the centromere and the telomeres. The rest tends to be euchromatin, more accessible DNA. But again, here we see the idea of the heterogeneous makeup of a typical chromosome. We've got heterochromatin on the ends, making up the telomeres, heterochromatin at the centromere, but other regions are also wrapped quite tightly. Here's a region of heterochromatin that just contains genes we know we're not going to need. Much of the rest of the chromosome is in euchromatin, more accessible, more easy to get at. And so we have a, a dynamic heterogeneous chromosome here that is changing its structure as needed by the cell. The formation of heterochromatin, the signaling for forming heterochromatin is controlled largely by the histone code. The pattern of modifications on these histone proteins in these regions signal to the cell to wrap that DNA up very tightly into heterochromatin. Likewise, other signals on the histone code promote the formation of euchromatin and keep that DNA more accessible. 
DNA that's packaged as heterochromatin is inaccessible, so most of the time these regions are free of genes. It's very, very difficult to turn a gene on that's wrapped in heterochromatin. It's just too tightly compacted. Sometimes genes are very close to heterochromatin boundaries, and sometimes mistakes are made. Sometimes a gene can be mistakenly packaged in heterochromatin. When that happens, that gene becomes inaccessible, and that cell behaves as a complete loss of function mutant. In fact, it is though that cell does not contain that gene at all anymore. There's one example of this from flies. There's a particular gene in flies called white, and it's needed for proper eye development. The white gene is near a heterochromatin boundary, but in a normal healthy cell, the heterochromatin forms, there's a barrier, a molecular barrier there that stops the spread of heterochromatin, and the white gene is in euchromatin and is expressed normally, giving the fly a normal eye. However, sometimes there's a mutation and that barrier gets put in the wrong place. When that happens and that barrier is misplaced, the heterochromatin spreads, and it spreads so much that the white gene itself is included in heterochromatin, and it is wrapped too tightly to become accessible. And as a result, the fly has mutant eyes. It has white specks in its eyes, in fact. That's where the white gene gets its name. So when a gene is wrapped in heterochromatin, it is essentially gone and inaccessible to the cell. Heterochromatin is reserved specifically for sequence of DNA that were known to be not needed, period. If there's a potential for need of a gene, that gene must be kept in euchromatin. There's a human condition, a rare form of human anemia, that is also caused by this very same phenomenon. Uh, where a human hemoglobin gene is too close to a heterochromatin boundary and gets included in heterochromatin spreading. And when that happens, that hemoglobin gene is permanently lost by the individual. It is inaccessible, and anema forms uh, as a result. <coughs> so our last topic here is the concept of chromatin changes being inherited. We tend to think in general, that we get our DNA from our parents, we get half of our genome from our mother and half of our genome from our father, and that this inherited genome makes up our genetic component, makes up our nature. And then we think that our environment also plays a role in who we are and what we become, and so that is our nurture component, and that is our nature, nurture, um, kind of holistic view. However, the real truth is, and is increasingly shown to be, that the environment affects our physiology. More specifically, the environment affects the histone code. The environment we're in affects the patterns that are on those histone proteins. Now those patterns affect DNA accessibility. The accessibility of DNA affects gene expression, which is just another way of saying affects the proteins that we make. And if you got anything out of the first lecture, what I hope you got is that proteins are everything. So if we're affecting protein synthesis, we are be affecting the behavior of that organism. So let's go through that again. We're saying the environment affects the histones. The histones regulate the accessibility of DNA. Whether DNA is accessible or not affects if genes are on or not. And when genes are on or off, you make or don't make proteins respectively. And so our environment affects our protein synthesis. Our environment directly affects our cellular physiology. We knew that intuitively, but what's becoming clearer now is that many of these histone code modifications that are environmentally induced are heritable. The implications of that, said simply, is that the effects of the environment on your parents' chromatin, or even the effects of the environment on your grandparents' chromatin, could still be represented in your own genome, in your own nuclei, right now, affecting how your cells behave. Now, take a moment to grasp the weight of that. That means the environment of your parents or grandparents, the environmental effect on them, is being propagated in your own cells now, even when you're no longer in that environment. This concept, this phenomenon, is called epigenetics. And that phrase is meant to translate to standing on top of genetics, or trumping genetics. And it works in a very simpler, simple mechanism. When a genome is copied, now this is in a single cell, one cell going to two daughter cells, mitosis. When a genome is copied and DNA is replicated, 
the old nucleosomes that were wrapping the original DNA molecule are evenly distributed to each of the new replicated DNA molecules. Those nucleosomes, because they're being evenly distributed, provide about half the needed nucleosomes. The remainder of the nucleosomes are made up by new nucleosomes that form on the new DNA. So let's take a look at this figure from your book to kind of put pictures to those words. Here we have a single DNA molecule wrapped up in nucleosomes, and these nucleosomes have been modified, so the modifications, the patterns on those histones are represented by these blue squares. This DNA is replicated, so this one molecule of DNA is made into two, and these existing nucleosomes are evenly distributed among the two new molecules. So we have a total of 12 histones that we see here, nucleosomes that we see here, and six of those have gone to this, and six of those have gone to here. So half of the original nucleosomes are given to each of the new DNA molecules. The remaining nucleosomes to make up the even 12 are new nucleosomes that do not contain the modification. However, the information in these modifications is important to the cell, so to accurately transmit those histone modifications on to the new daughter cells, the new nucleosomes are given the same modifications as the old neighboring nucleosomes. In other words, protein complexes are recruited in to say, well, we had a blue square here, we should put a blue square here. We had a blue square here, so we should put a blue square here. And so this histone code that was present in the original maternal molecule is propagated and copied. It is inherited into the new strands. This mechanism is used to provide a type of cellular memory, allowing the DNA to remember its state in the previous cell. Remember, this code means something. It means transcribe me, or it means don't transcribe me. It means put more histones here, or it means silence me, form me into heterochromatin, form me into euchromatin. Whatever the signal is, was important in this cell. And you want that signal to be transmitted and inherited by the new daughter cell. If this DNA was meant to be silenced, it should be silenced here as well. So this is a type of cellular memory, allowing the DNA to remember its own state. But it also facilitates what we call epigenetic inheritance, where the chromatin modifications in the maternal cell are passed on to the daughter cell. I can't express to you in words how much this initially flied in the face of what we understood in molecular biology. The prevailing wisdom in molecular biology up until about 15 years ago was that the only thing that could ever be inherited by a new cell from an old was the DNA sequence itself, the C's, the A's, the T's, and the G's. Everything else was believed to start from scratch. But now we see time and time again that we not only inherit the DNA sequence from previous cells, but also the histone code the patterns of methylation, acetylation, and phosphorylation that contain their own unique information. This is often good. It allows progenitor cells to give rise to new cells that behave appropriately in a multicellular organism. If I have one lung cell that divides into two, I don't want each new lung cell to have to relearn what genes it needs to express and what genes it shouldn't. I want the two new lung cells to remember cellularly what the patterns were that made the maternal cell a lung cell in the first place. That saves a great deal of energy and a great deal of, of time. However, this is also bad because if we have histone code patterns that send the signal of a very stressful environment, this is a bad place to live. This is a stressful place to live, and methylation patterns can carry that information. That information is transmitted to the next cell. That information is transmitted to the gametes, and that information is actually transmitted to the offspring. It's been shown using rats, and more recently even with people, that the children of abused individuals, the pups of abused rats, grow up to be more fearful, more sensitive to stress, because their genomes remember the abuse of the parent. Let me say that again. The abuse of the parental organism or individual changes the histone code in that individual as a response to that environmental stress.
But then when that abused individual mates and propagates, they pass that histone code to their offspring. So even if the offspring are raised in a completely stress-free, loving environment, their histones contain the information of stressful, abusive environments. And their physiology responds in kind. So they become more sensitive to stress, more fearful, more timid, depressed immune systems, etc. And so this mechanism for cellular memory often carries memories forward into the next generation that are detrimental and also no longer relevant because the environment has changed. Again, this is just one example. It's been shown in many, many different ways, but it's true. It happens. And only now are we beginning to scratch the surface of understanding and beginning to fully appreciate the interplay between our environment and our genetics, but still we have a long way to go to understand how the environment affects our genes, how it affects our chromatin, and how that information can be transmitted into future generations. So we'll wrap up by just summarizing the larger points of what we covered today. We started off just talking about chromosomes in general. We use the term chromosome molecularly to just represent very long stretches of single DNA molecules that are packaged and condensed so that they can fit in a cell's nucleus. We said that there's no correlation whatsoever between chromosome number or genome size and the complexity of the organism. Remember, the organism on this planet with the most number of chromosomes is a fern. The organism on this planet with the largest genome is an amoeba. And we ta also talked about those, whatever they were, muck jacks, whatever they were called, uh, that had a very, very different number of chromosomes, but very, very similar morphology. We talked about the different states that chromosomes take during the cell cycle. During interphase, chromosomes are much more relaxed and less packaged. This allows them to be replicated more easily. During mitosis, soon after interphase, chromosomes are at their densest, most packaged state, and this allows them to be easily moved and dealt out to new daughter cells during mitosis. Inside the nucleus, during interphase, when chromosomes are fairly relaxed and easily tangled, they seem to be zoned to particular regions of the nucleus and this seems to prevent them from becoming tangled with one another. Very, very interesting idea. We then moved on to the essence of eukaryotic DNA packaging. We started off talking about nucleosomes. The fundamental component of a nucleosome are the histone proteins, two copies each of H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. These come together to form an octamer of protein, and the DNA wraps around that octamer spool. So a nucleosome is a histone octamer, and about 147 base pairs of DNA wrapped around the outer surface of it. Nucleosomal DNA can be further coiled. If we create a coiled helix of nucleosomal DNA, we have made the 30 nanometer fiber. And this is the loosest, least densely compacted physiological form of DNA that you would find in a living cell. We briefly went over further compaction, but it's a, pretty much a black box. We don't really understand how DNA is further compacted uh, to be a mitotic chromosome. And moving on from there, we talked about how cells can kind of compact and op oppose this compaction and still have some access to DNA sequences that are important. So cells use a variety of strategies to get access to DNA sequences that are in euchromatin. And these include the ATP-dependent chromatin remodeling complexes, which just push nucleosomes out of the way. Histone acetyltransferases, or HATs, which acetylate histones, weakening their interaction or affinity for negative DNA. HDACs, histone deacetylation complexes, which restore the native positive charge on lysines, undo the effect of the HATs, strengthening the affinity between nucleosomes, um, between histones and DNA, and locking nucleosomes in place. And we also talked about the histone code in general, sending signals for accessibility or sequestration. Finally, we talked a little bit about epigenetics. That's the environmental effect of, on the histone code. The environment plays a role in modifying the histone code, and histone methylation, phosphorylation, and acetylation patterns change as a result of environment. But more importantly, these changes are transmitted to future generations. These changes in the histone code, which stand on top of the actual DNA sequence, can be inherited in future generations. That affects accessibility of the DNA, affects gene expression, and this is the idea of epigenetics. So that's it for chapter 5, excuse me. We'll be moving on to the first half of chapter 6 with the next lecture. That's going to revolve predominantly around DNA replication, and from there we'll move on to DNA repair in the lecture after that.
Uh, but this is the end of the Chapter 5 material.